right. So the next area that we're doing is the Hunter's Dream. Mm -hmm. And like the clinic, it is a very, very small area. It's actually significantly smaller than the clinic. But also like the clinic, there's a lot that is implicit in it. There's a lot. It's it's very, very dense. There is a lot going on. It relates to a whole lot of other areas. It relates to a whole lot of other parts of the story. And it ties back into a whole lot of the themes that the game is exploring. So our first encounter with the dream is actually before we go there, really. It's when we're being ministered. The messengers appear on us and we hear the doll say... <sighs> You found yourself a hunter. When we wake up from the ministration, we have the hunter's mark in our inventory, and that's what's binding us to the dream. Mm -hmm. And it's found all over the place, too. Yeah, exactly. People talk about Dark Souls as though it's a cycle, a cycle of light and dark that's recurring. And it really isn't. It's a cycle in the sense that it's a cyclical world with like one age follows another age, but follows another age. But all those ages are different. It's not going between two poles. It's not going from summer to winter over and over again. Whereas Bloodborne is overtly the same cycle recurring over and over again. Because we keep hearing about these previous lands like Lauren, where the same thing happened. They also had beast blood and a medical church, and the civilizations rose and fell in the same way that Yarnum is rising and falling. So the hunter's mark is something that we find throughout history in the same way, and we also find hunters throughout history in the same way. The hunter's mark is all over the chalice dungeons. It's all the way down to the bottom. It's actually on the altar that Queen Yarnum is praying to. The concept of hunters also that is a thing that recurs throughout history it's not just us so german is the first hunter in the sense that he's the first of that particular group who are called the hunters but the kind of person german is and the kind of people the hunters are that's something that has recurred throughout all these different civilizations and there's even multiple kinds of hunter in the present so basically, people who destroyed beasts after a plague have always existed type deal. When you put it like that, it sounds very obvious that if you have a beast problem, it makes sense that there would be people whose job it was to hunt the beasts and put the beasts down. But it's more than that. It's that the same kinds of people are recurring. So if we go into the Chalice Dungeons... You have, for example, the the knights there, and they're wearing a cowl that looks like Volta's helmet. And presumably they, they have the same issue with their eyes. One of their eyes is rotted out. There's also evidence in the Chalice Dungeons of people who basically have transforming weapons, like the trick weapons that the hunters use. And that's also really interesting, because we're told that the trick weapons are something that was created in German's workshop. Going to the surface, like even in the recent history, you also see the same things happen with the Knights of Canehurst. The Knights of Canehurst, they had to put down beasts. It's very specific that Canehurst had a beast problem, the Knights existed to fight them, and the Knights wielded transforming weapons. They have the transforming Rider Palish, and they have the transforming Chikage. And they all fight in the same way, because we see evidence of very, very thick plate armor existing. But this specific type of person, this hunter that recurs, no matter what the civilization is, they are wearing light armor that lets them move very quickly. So even though the game talks about like trick weapons and light armor being German's combat style, yes, German came up with it independently, but he's not the first person to be like that. That's something that has, it's always recurred, it's always happened, and it's a response to how you fight a beast, how you fight something that's faster than you. There's also a lot of calling back to old things when we look at Hunter Gear, like Ludwig's Moonlight Sword. That's specifically, he found that. That's something he found in the dungeons. It's not a, a weapon that was made in Yarnum, but it's dug up and brought back. And then it talks about how like Ludwig's hunters, the ones that served under him, the ones that served the church, it specifically likens them to knights from an old age of chivalry. 
So even though like Ludwig and German, they're both hunters, but they both came from different places. And then it specifies no Ludwig. Ludwig is actually, he's like something that is older, even though he comes after German. So throughout the game, there is this constant reference to like your heritage, where you came from. The game makes it clear that hunting isn't just a profession, it's got a legacy to it. And it refers constantly to things like, if you're a hunter, you're carrying the torch of the hunt. You've inherited the will of the hunt. Like, it talks about it in those terms. It doesn't just talk about it in terms of you're a beast hunter. If we look at the Japanese script, in the places where it mentions carrying the torch of the hunt or inheriting the will of the hunt, it says that we have the Ishii of the hunt. What is the Ishii of the hunt, Richie? So the Ishii of the hunt basically means we're possessed by a will or a need to hunt. It's like our destiny to hunt. So it always has that aspect to it. It's not just that we have an agreement with German that we'll hunt. It's like it becomes part of us. And if we look at the other characters in the game who have been hunters at some point, it also never leaves them. Like Eileen is someone who has been to the hunter's dream. She went through what we went through, but afterwards she could not leave. Alfred also says he used to be a hunter. We don't know if he was a hunter of the dream, but he was a hunter. And when we meet him now, it's some time later, and he has adopted the will of Ligarius. He can't go back to a normal life. Dura also, like, he's been to the dream, we assume, based on how he talks. It's not just that one day you have to go and hunt beasts, and then the night ends and you can pack up and leave. It's this legacy and this tradition that once it touches you, it, it can't really leave you. And that's what the hunter's mark is kind of getting at. You are marked. This thing is in you. This makes Bloodborne seem, like, very scary. Well, there is that recurring thing that I mentioned where once you inherit a legacy, you inherit everything about it and you don't have a choice in the parts that you inherit. So if you are a hunter, you have inherited, whether you like it or not, the fishing hamlet, because that's part of your history. So what you just said makes me think of the dialogue we hear from Simon, where he goes, So our forefathers sin. We hunters cannot bear their weight forever. It isn't fair. It just isn't fair. Yeah, that's exactly what it is, because Simon's very specific, our forefathers sinned. It wasn't Simon that did it. And... Every hunter is going to have to live with that until it's actually dealt with, until it's actually resolved. And you see that with German. German has this very uneasy, restless sleep. And we find out later on, when we defeat the orphan, that when the orphan was gone, he started sleeping soundly again. Finally, that creepy adult baby is dead. And the, the same thing is like, we'll, we'll talk about Yarnum as a city later on, but the same thing happens to Yarnum because Yarnum has its roots in Thumaru. And even if the people of Yarnum aren't consciously aware of that, it shapes the city and it shapes the people in it. And it, it's interesting that the ending of Bloodborne that lets us get away from having to hunt again, that lets us actually leave the hunt behind, is the ending where we transcend humanity entirely so i guess with that out of the way we'll talk about the actual structure of where we are and what the hunter's dream really is so the hunter's dream itself is a facsimile of german's old workshop which is a physical real place in yarnum it's a copy of the workshop but it's an idealized peaceful happy copy of the workshop so the way that the dream is idealized is really, really interesting when you compare it to the other dreamlands that we visit, because those are all hellscapes. Those are all horrifying. So the way the dreamlands work in Bloodborne is very heavily informed by the way that they work in Lovecraft, although they're not exactly the same thing. The dreamlands in Lovecraft are called the dreamlands because you visit them by dreaming. They're like another plane of existence that you, you project yourself to when you're sleeping. 
And if you're strong enough, if you've been in the dreamlands long enough and you understand them, they function like a lucid dream. You can start shifting and changing them with your willpower. So the way that German is able to live in this very idyllic, peaceful land, it calls to mind the character of King Curaness from Lovecraft's Dream Quest stories. So Curaness is a character who starts by dreaming up this huge, gleaming, opulent, fantastical city. But the longer he's there, the longer he is in the dreamlands, the more nostalgia he feels for his childhood, for you know, simple things on Earth. So he then dreams up a little replica of the village that he grew up in in Cornwall. So the Dreamlands in Bloodborne follow broadly similar rules to this in that they are products of the consciousnesses that are stuck there. When we go to the Hunter's Nightmare, it's a memory of Yarnum, but it's a traumatic memory of Yarnum. It's a Yarnum where the streets are a river of blood that the buildings are literally sinking into. When we see Lawrence in the Nightmare, he is burning on the altar. So the other dreamlands that we see, what seems to be shaping them is unconscious. It's people's traumas, it's people's fears about who they were and what they did. But German clearly does have fears and traumas. When he's asleep in his chair, you can hear him crying and calling out for somebody to free him. Lawrence, Master Willem... Somebody, help me. Unshackle me, please. Anybody. I've had enough of this dream. The night blocks all sight. Oh, somebody. Please. So, if the hunter's dream follows the same logic as these other places, it should look like the hunter's nightmare. It should not look like an idyllic little refuge for German. So why do you think it's different? Um, that's actually a really good point. I haven't thought of it this way. So there's references to there being some kind of agreement between Lawrence, the Hunters, and the Moon Presence. And this agreement was made when the Moon Presence was summoned the first time. So in the case of the Hunter's Nightmare, we know very specifically that that's the result of a curse. That's all created in anger by cause. It's a punishment for the hunters because of what they did. Nightmare Frontier and Nightmare of Mensis, obviously we don't get explicit confirmation of their origins, but the game makes a big point of associating them with Lauren, and we know that Lauren was also cursed. That's where Bastards of Lauren come from. So given that the game makes a big point out of history repeating itself, it makes sense that the Nightmare of Mensis slash Nightmare Frontier area, that's the kind of hunter's nightmare equivalent for Lauren. It's a place that was created in anger when they also did something to the Great Ones. So when the hunter's dream is created, it's created when Lawrence summons the Moon Presence. He doesn't invoke the wrath of the Moon Presence. He just summons it. And I think that's the key. That's what makes it different. This is touching on something else that the game says that's kind of hard to pass if you don't have context for it. Because it, it says that the Great Ones are sympathetic in spirit and will answer when called upon. So the word sympathetic can kind of imply that the Great Ones feel sorry for you, but it really just means that the Great Ones will listen if you talk to them. They can be communicated with, they can understand what your desires are, and you can understand their desires, and you can make agreements. So the fact that the Hunter's Dream is as idyllic as it is, it's the opposite of every other dreamland, that seems to be a product of the agreement that Lawrence reached with the Moon Presence. This was not a place that was made in anger. It's a place that was made as a refuge to begin with. So I think it's significant that the beckoning of the Moon Presence happens at German's old workshop. Because remember that at the point Lawrence does that, 
the healing church are pretty well established. Like they have the grand cathedral, they have their loom and flower gardens, they have their own workshop, they have their own laboratories. But Lawrence chooses to beckon the moon presence in German's old workshop. You know, I didn't look at it this way before you actually brought it up. Like, why not back in the moon presence in one of your fancy facilities? Yeah, exactly. That's like really, really, I think, significant to understanding what Lawrence is doing. Because I think this is actually Lawrence admitting that he fucked up. Oh, how so? Because... What's happened is, in spite of having all these facilities, when Lawrence decides to execute this part of his plan, he goes back to the beginning. He goes back to German's old workshop. He's going back to before there was a healing church. So German was involved in the Fishing Hamlet raid, which predates the church existing. So Lawrence and German's relationship and German's workshop, those predate there being a healing church. So what Lawrence is doing by beckoning the moon presence at German's old workshop is he's kind of backing away from the healing church in a sense. He chooses to perform his big ceremony at this old, old place that's actually in the shadow of the church. The church has grown up around this place. It's towering over it. The church has its own workshop that is in a lot of ways superior to German's. It has more resources. It's a larger building. That's literally towering over this old place, but that old place is where Lawrence chooses to go. And you really get a sense from the abandoned old workshop just how old it actually is. It's not just that it's it's tucked away somewhere and the other parts of Yarnum have grown up around it. It's that if you look at the great tree, that tree is probably hundreds of years old. Like it has been growing and growing and growing and it is enormous. And when we see the roots of the tree in the dream, you can see that there's gravestones that are in the roots of the tree. So not only is this place old, but people have been buried here before the tree was the size it is now. So it's really, really old. Presumably, it's also much, much older than German is, because if you read German's item descriptions, it says that a lot of German's gear comes from before there was a workshop, but clearly the building has always existed. It's just that it maybe wasn't German's workshop until recently. So by going back here, Lawrence is kind of admitting that all of the scientific progress that he made, all of the things that he did... They ultimately just led him back to the old ways. He just rediscovered something that people already knew. If you look at the way the healing church functioned, there was a very, very long period where they were trying to contact the great ones through performing all of these scientific experiments. And they're injecting water into people. They're injecting blood into people. But when he actually has to go and contact the great ones, the time it works... He goes back to this old secluded little building and he contacts them there. And he contacts them using the link they have with their children. That also tells us a little bit about why the dream looks the way it does. Because even though it's based on a real location, it's suspended in this sea of fog and surrounded by these wooden pillars that don't really do anything. But when you look at it as... Lawrence admitting that the healing church was a failure, you realize that the hunter's dream is literally cathedral ward if there was no healing church. There's no plaza, there's no clock, there's no workshop, it's just the old house. You don't you don't have any any comments? We didn't really talk about this on the podcast, so I'm like absorbing the information. So having brought up Lawrence's summoning of the moon presence, we should talk about what a third chord actually is, because it's something that we brought up on the last episode. And like I said, it's one of those things like pale blood that recurs throughout the game. It's not really tied to one specific area, but this is the place we see the third chord actually used. So we'll talk about them now. So a third chord is not actually an umbilical chord. This is something that caused a lot of problems because on top of having like a Japanese script, Bloodborne also has two different English scripts, depending on the region that you're in. 
So if you have the North American Bloodborne script, it calls the third chords one third of an umbilical chord. And if you have the European version, it just calls them one third umbilical chord, as if it's one of a thing that is called a third umbilical chord. So a third chord is an organ that is referred to as an umbilical cord, and it's likened to an umbilical cord because of its function. So it's an organ that only children of the Great Ones have, and it is the organ that essentially links them to the parent. So that's why it's called an umbilical cord, but it's not literally one. So to understand exactly what's significant about that, we have to look at Japanese traditions involving umbilical cords. Japanese culture puts a fair amount of emphasis on the umbilical cord as a link between parent and child, to the point where it's not uncommon for Japanese people to keep their umbilical cords preserved in a little box as a kind of memento of the link they have with their parents. So what the third cord is, is it's that embodiment of the link between the Great One and its child. And they're drawn to the cords because they're in a perpetual state of mourning for their lost children. You can also use it to just connect with them. This is what the game is getting at when it mentions Willem seeking the cord to help elevate his thoughts. He's not necessarily trying to summon the Great Ones with the cord. He's just trying to make a connection with them and think like them. So we should now talk about the exact nature of the agreement that Lawrence made with the Moon Presence. Oh, Lawrence, what's taking you so long? I've grown too old for this. Of little use now, I'm afraid. So we know that Lawrence left German in the dream and that he intended to come back at some point. So we should talk about like who Lawrence is in game because it's something that is kind of obscure and a little confusing. So we encounter one thing in the game that is definitively Lawrence's physical remains and that's the skull. So all we know from the skull definitively is that Lawrence is dead, he was decapitated and he did turn into a beast. There's also two other instances where we encounter something that is named Lawrence, but they're both in the nightmare. Those are the Lawrence boss and the Lawrence skull. Now, if we look at the Lawrence skull in the nightmare, it's very specific, straightforward. It says this skull only exists in the nightmare. So it's saying, yeah, Lawrence's skull in the nightmare looks different to Lawrence's skull in the physical world. The Lawrence boss we encounter is a burning cleric beast, and it's also confirmed in-game that Lawrence became the first cleric beast. Like Lawrence's human skull, the cleric beast boss version of Lawrence is something that exists in the nightmare. It's not something that necessarily existed in the waking world. Other good examples, Mikolash. Mikolash is a mummy in the waking world. He is running around in the nightmare. Maria is buried, but in the dream she is alive again. Orphan of Cause is a pile of body parts in the dream. He is a grown man. So the form that Lawrence takes in the nightmare isn't necessarily a one-to-one -one reflection of the form he had in the waking world. It's also worth pointing out that the cleric beast that Lawrence becomes in the nightmare is burning. But it, it hasn't been set on fire. It's that its blood is lava. The fire is coming from within it. That's why when you approach it, the, the hand, like the fire in the hand begins to grow. When he's damaged enough, he bleeds lava. His legs fall off. He is dragging lava around. If we look at Ludwig's beast form, it's really unlike any other beast forms that we see in game. Like nothing looks like this. Not only the fact that it is closer to a horse than a wolf or an ape, but the fact that it has that second head. It's completely twisted. It has like it, it has six legs. It's... Just to be clear, Ludwig was always an evil devil horse from hell. See, I, I know that you're trolling me, but that 
that also is relevant because the form of Ludwig's boss, it's very closely modeled on Horseface, who's one of the demons that tortures you in one of the Buddhist hells. So it looks almost exactly like the Hunter's Nightmare with the pools of blood and the bodies in them kind of reaching out, trying to escape. So we talked about how the dreamlands are malleable and they're changed by like the people that are in them, but unconsciously. So Ludwig's beast form, I think he didn't look like that in the waking world. I think what happened is because he spent his life killing people, when he ended up in the nightmare, his self-image was that of a demon that tortures you in the afterlife. So his form shifted toward that over time in the same way that the orphan was not born that way. But the rage of the orphan and the rage of cause gradually shaped the orphan into that. And that's also why people will say, well, the orphan has a blade like German. And it's like, yeah, I think that's very deliberate. I think it's very deliberate that the orphan has a blade like German because the orphan's mother was, we assume, killed by German. So the idea that the orphan takes on a form that is reminiscent of German is, I think, very deliberate. So going back to Lawrence, Lawrence's form in the nightmare, it seems to me more overtly symbolic in that, like, he is a cleric beast and what's burning him up is his blood. Because his blood is the thing he has been experimenting on. He wanted to use his blood to become something other than human. In the nightmare, it became something that was burning him up inside. Like his blood is turning on him. His blood is, is destroying him internally. The other thing that should be pointed out is that Cleric Beast is not one specific kind of thing. It's kind of confusing because we encounter that boss and it's just called Cleric Beast. But... Cleric beast just means a cleric who became a beast. So Vicar Amelia is a cleric beast. The blood-starved beast is a cleric beast. It's a distinction that the game uses to say that all the really, really big, nasty monsters in this game are the way they are because they used to be clerics. So what I'm getting at here is that Lawrence's skull in the waking world that is definitively a remnant of his physical body it's not the skull of a cleric beast. It's not the skull of a wolf. It's the skull of an ape. So Lawrence in the waking world, he is almost certainly the bloodletting beast from the Chalice Dungeons. Because that is a creature where the head absolutely matches the skull that is on the altar, right down to having a fracture in exactly the same spot. Also, the bloodletting beast definitively got beheaded. They make a whole point out of this thing's head got cut off. I think it's pretty clear that that is supposed to be Lawrence, even if they don't actively confirm it. And the Nightmare Lawrence being different, that doesn't mean that that's not Lawrence's physical body. So the reason I wanted to establish that the bloodletting beast is Lawrence is because that tells us where Lawrence went. Lawrence went to Thumaru. We find the Bloodletting Beast once in Lower Thumaru and then once in Thumaru Ihill. In Lower Thumaru, he has the head. In Thumaru Ihill, he's been beheaded. So at some point after Lower Thumaru, he was presumably killed and his head was taken back to the Healing Church. So if we continue to follow that path down, it will, of course, terminate in Queen Yarnum, and Queen Yarnum is pregnant. So the nature of the agreement that Lawrence has with the Moon Presence is that the Moon Presence will create and oversee this dream in exchange for Lawrence finding it a replacement child. So again, Lawrence's scientific ambitions going nowhere is a recurring theme, because in spite of everything the Healing Church did all the experimentation, all the research, the huge human cost that accompanied all of that, the key to what Lawrence wanted 
is actually just the relationship between a parent and a child, and the grief that's felt when that connection is broken. And that's not something that an organization that treats people as expendable subjects can actually engage with. So the last thing I want to talk about in the dream is the doll. And I want to start by talking about her function before I talk about who she is and where she came from. Okay, let's talk about the doll. Executive decision, let's talk about doll. The function of the doll in the dream is to make us stronger by using what the game is calling blood echoes. And that's kind of important because blood echoes are not actually blood. It's the echoes of blood that make us stronger. So exactly what blood echoes are is a little ambiguous. But if we look at the Japanese script, we get something that's a bit more concrete and kind of tells us how they function. So the Japanese name for blood echoes is going back to words we've talked about before. It's a blood ishi, the ishi of blood, in the same way that we have the ishi of the hunt. The connotation behind calling it ishi of blood or blood ishi or however you want to say it is that as we are running around Yarnum, hacking up people and squishing up cold blood, we are gradually liking more and more blood. And what the doll is doing is, when we talk to her, she's taking out of us the desire for blood. And she's changing that into something that makes us stronger. This is why our character does not go blood drunk throughout the events of the game, because when we start developing that lust for blood, the doll is able to take it out of us. And this is why, for example, Eileen. Eileen is someone who went to the dream. She is someone who went through the same events that we went through. When she is no longer attached to the dream, that's when she slips over into blood drunkenness. Gascoigne slips over into blood drunkenness. Alfred slips over into blood drunkenness, because... The more that they hunt, the more that they pursue blood, the worse it gets. And the doll is the reason that we stay sane. So that's the doll's purpose in the dream. Her purpose in the waking world is a little more vague, but it actually seems to be, again, symbolically the same thing. From the doll's tear, we get a unique blood gem that has the effect of healing us. And on the description of that gem, it specifies that the doll's creator wished for something like this. This is kind of a manifestation of his hopes for the doll, what he poured into the doll and what he wanted from the doll. So even in the waking world, before there was a dream, the purpose of this doll was to provide a kind of healing, was to provide support, was to be a friend, a quiet friend. That's what it calls it. We also see on the descriptions of the doll's clothing that so much love and care has been poured into this thing that even though no one's wearing it, it still feels warm. So her function in the dream seems to be a reflection of her function in the waking world. She was there to keep her creator grounded. She was there to keep her creator sane. She was there to calm people. And in the dream that has manifested in her actually coming to life and having the property of soothing your spirit and stopping you from tipping over into bloodlust. So as well as the doll being a manifestation of this desire to heal and to calm, she is also possessed by some fragment, some part of Maria. But crucially, it's not actually Maria's spirit or something like that. She is independent of Maria. She persists after Maria is gone. But at the same time, she feels a connection to Maria. She will recognize things that are connected to Maria. And when Maria finally passes on from the nightmare, the doll describes herself as feeling liberated. Good hunter. This may sound strange, but have I somehow changed? Moments ago, from some place, perhaps deep within, I sensed a liberation from heavy shackles. Not that I would know. How passing strange. So even though it's pretty clear that German made the doll as a means of coping with Maria's death, when she does come to life, she is her own entity. She is not a replacement for Maria. 
The relationship between Maria and the doll is an interesting one, because our encounters with both of them could not be more different. When we encounter the doll, she is trying to heal us, and when we encounter Maria, she tries to kill us. This makes them seem like they're polar opposites, but at the same time, we also kind of meet two different Marias when we go to the research hall. There's the Maria in the clock tower who tries to kill us, and then there's the Maria that we hear about from the patients, and they're very, very different people. The Maria that we hear about from the patients is someone who comforted them. She's someone who, when they're frightened and in pain, they call out for her. There's a very important exchange that we have with Adeline, where Adeline will tell you that Maria opposed her becoming a blood saint. Lady Maria never approved, but I am proud to have been a blood saint. And then when she did become a blood saint, Maria's response was to give Adeline the key to the balcony so that Adeline could smell the lumen flowers and the smell would comfort her. So from Adeline and from the other patients, you get an image of someone who is not unlike the doll, someone who is there to comfort and someone who is there to heal. The Adeline thing is really interesting because Maria opposes Adeline becoming a blood saint, but all she does, from what we can tell, is say, please don't do it, and then when Adeline goes through with it, she just tries to help Adeline deal. When Maria doesn't want us to do something in the clock tower, she tries to kill us. She's incredibly violent. She is trying to stop us physically from getting through to the Hamlet. So what we get in the research hall are actually two different Marias. So the Maria that we actually meet in the research hall, we'll talk about that when we talk about the research hall. What I'm interested in here is that the other Maria, the one that we don't really encounter physically, but we hear about, she is basically the doll from what we hear. The other really interesting point of comparison between the doll and Maria is going back to the question of how Bloodborne depicts heritage, how it depicts ancestry, how it depicts where you came from. Because the Maria that we encounter in the Clock Tower, like Lawrence, like Ludwig, she seems to be a manifestation of everything Maria feared about herself. She's using the Rakuyo that Maria threw away. She's using Kanehurst bloodblade techniques that we know Maria frowned upon. She's the woman that was involved in the Hamlet massacre. She's someone who is weighed down by the guilt of what she has done, by her relationship with the hunters, and by her ancestry as someone from Kanehurst. And it's a legacy that, like the other hunters in the Nightmare, it has literally trapped them in hell. The doll doesn't question where she's from. She just says that she's a doll and she was made by humans. The fact that she is something that's born out of a desire for companionship, out of a desire for comfort, means that she is not weighed down in the same way the other characters are. Crucially, she doesn't understand the concept of nostalgia unless you give her the hair clip. So we talked before about Bloodborne's world being this cycle with civilizations rising and falling in the same way over and over again. And it culminates in the childhood's beginning ending where it's implied that a new world has been born. We have started again. And I think it's really, really important that the two entities that survive to that ending, the two entities that will usher in the next world, they're also the only two things from that old world that managed to completely unshackle themselves from who they were and where they came from. Okay, 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 okay. That was all. That was all. Richie.
Okay, okay. If you if this is your first time listening to the channel, there's about 400 other Bloodborne videos on it. But also, there is a podcast about cryptids and a podcast where we watch Katekyo Hitman Reborn and another podcast where we watch other anime. And if that's not enough, if you go to the Patreon at the two dollar tier, you get um, you get a lot of you get a lot more of just us talking. It's mostly about Bloodborne such as locations of Bloodborne, um, badges of Bloodborne, enemies of Bloodborne. Yeah, yeah. And since we're doing these in order, the next episode will be Central Yarnum.